Thank you. The final item of business is a member's business debate on motion 6230 in the name of Alexander Burnett on improving outcomes for people with neurological conditions. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would ask those members who would wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons and I call on Alexander Burnett to open the debate around seven minutes please Mr Burnett. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I thank members from across the Chamber for their support in bringing this motion to debate. Uh, the motion speaks to the Together for the One in Six report uh, from the Neurological Alliance of Scotland, an umbrella body of organisations which represents people with neurological conditions. Uh, and I want to thank them for their hard work, uh, and I'm delighted uh, some members have joined us, been able to join us in the gallery today. Now, the report presents findings from their recent patient experience survey, uh, and it is the only survey of its kind exploring the views of people living with a wide range of neurological conditions, and was the first time residents of Scotland participated. Now, this debate is important because there is a serious lack of funding towards care and data on neurological conditions, which can be hard to diagnose and treat. Now, the primary recommendation uh, is to improve data collection so that there is a greater knowledge on how many people live with each condition. Now, I understand that the Scottish Government funded SPIRE to collect such data, but I regret to note that publishing of the data has already been delayed by six months. In addition, this data only considers primary care, which is limiting and does not give an accurate picture of prevalence. And the Scottish Government's Neurological Care and Support, a national framework for action for 2020 to 25, plans to allocate four and a half million to improving care for people with neurological conditions. And one project is the Epilepsy Register, which has helped understand prevalence and improve outcomes, for example, by identifying unscheduled care and hospital admissions by people with epilepsy and targeting care to those at greatest risk of harm. But this is just the start and needs to be implemented for all neurological conditions. Because you know, COVID has undoubtedly caused a major disruption, but issues with care and treatment extend beyond the pandemic. Now, according to the survey, 37% of adults in Scotland wait more than 12 months from first symptoms to getting a diagnosis. And disappointingly, the Scottish Government's framework for action excludes children and young people and I'd like to ask the Minister to include them in focus for future projects. Because we know that delays for children are worse than anywhere else in the UK, and this is simply appalling. And as for adults, 15% haven't seen a specialist nurse for over a year, and nearly half report delays to routine appointments with neurologists. Yeah, certainly. Daniel Johnson. As someone that personally experiences that care, I uh, often find at my annual checkup that the person actually knows less about my condition uh, than, than I do. So, first of all, I think it's more that we have that routine checkup, but also that there's actually the knowledge and expertise there for the people with the particular neurological condition that they're seeking help and therapy for. Alexander Burnett. Thank the member for that intervention and the knowledge gap is something that I'll certainly come to and I'd also hope that the Minister uh, will be able to address when, when she speaks. Uh, because I've also heard from uh, constituents uh, such as Steve who has sleep apnea, peripheral neuropath, autism and functional neurological disorder. And he told me he had to travel to Dundee to speak with neurologists and to go between private and NHS treatments due to long waiting lists and no appropriate NHS treatment pathways. Again, completely unacceptable. And it's clear that the lack of specialist training and recruitment is key. In Aberdeen, for example, there are just three private consultants and five NHS consultants at the ARI. And yet they cover not only Grampian, but also Murray, Orkney and Shetland. Because the Scottish Government simply hasn't allocated appropriate resources to cater to patients' needs. And for the record, can I express my disappointment that the Scottish Government's National Workforce Strategy for Health and Social Care in Scotland, published in March, doesn't mention neurology once. Now, there are a variety of different neurological conditions, including epilepsy, MS, cerebral palsy, MND, Parkinson's, ME, and others. And these conditions are complex, can be lifelong and progressive, and in some cases, terminal. Symptoms and progression of conditions can vary, and we also don't know the implications of long COVID. 
but I understand 1% of respondents have long COVID and have experienced the same issues in their treatment and care. One child with long COVID in my constituency is having to seek private appointments in London. So from the outset, patients should be given detailed information to help them come to terms with their condition, understand what the future might look like for them and how symptoms might progress. Yet 30% of adults and 38% of children who responded said they left the consulting room with no information about their condition. Again, simply not good enough. These patients are not getting the care and support that they need. And the result is people not understanding their condition, failing to initiate treatment, and a potential quickening in the progression of their disease. We need a neurological workforce that is fit for purpose. For example, there is no ME or chronic fatigue syndrome, specialist consultants in Scotland, and only one specialist nurse. So care becomes the responsibility of GPs who do not receive adequate training in how to diagnose and manage the condition, the gap I think the member was referring to earlier. So training for healthcare professionals is needed urgently. And as early diagnosis and proper management give patients the best chance of a long-term improvement. And funding undoubtedly plays a key role and the British Heart Foundation Solving the Puzzle report highlighted that the Scottish Government budgeted just 65.5 million in 2018 for funding clinical research. But accounting for inflation, this figure has actually fallen over the last decade by more than 13 million. And again, is much smaller compared to the rest of the UK. And we can see the consequences of this, where, for example, in Scotland, the latest figures for funding for ME is just one pound per patient per year. Now, to date, 2.2 million of the Scottish Government's Framework for Action funding has been awarded to 37 projects, but half remains unspent. So can I ask the Minister, in a response tonight, to outline how she will allocate the remaining budget? And can the Minister also provide insight into what happens to these projects and commit to continue funding for neurological care and research after 2025? because we still don't know the exact number of people in Scotland who suffer with neurological conditions because there is no adequate data system in place. But what we do know is that the lack of research and funding into neurological conditions and treatment is having negative consequences on the care and support available to patients. There is no short-term fix, and meanwhile, the population data indicates that the prevalence of people living with neurological conditions over the long term is increasing. So the five aims of a framework remain just as relevant now, post-pandemic, as they were in 2020. And veering off course at this stage would be a disaster and will potentially make things much worse. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Burnett. Could I remind all those members who wish to speak in the debate to ensure that the buttons are pressed? Thank you. And I now call Rona Mackay to be followed by Brian Whittle. Around four minutes, please, Ms Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I'm pleased to be able to contribute to today's debate on improving outcomes for people with neurological conditions, and I thank Alex and Xander Burnett for bringing it to the Chamber. Presiding Officer, the brain is a very complex organ, and neurological conditions vary enormously. These conditions can be caused by degenerative disease, stroke, accidents, mental ill health, and in rare cases, long COVID. The Together from the One in Six report um, from the Neurological Alliance of Scotland is interesting and extremely informative, and I thank them for their briefing. The Alliance says an estimated one million people in Scotland live with a neurological condition, such as cerebral palsy, stroke, dementia and epilepsy. And of course, all of these conditions are life-changing. The report explores the experiences of people with neurological conditions in Scotland, gathering data on a wide range of topics, including the impact of COVID, diagnosis and treatment, experience of hospital care, support for mental well-being, access to social care and welfare, education and employment. However, they also highlight issues such as a lack of staff, um, referenced by Alexandra Burnett, and services needed to fully support people with neurological conditions, leading to delays in diagnosis, treatment and routine appointments, as well as difficulties accessing mental wellbeing support. Presiding officer, of course none of these things are good, and the Scottish Government is very aware of the importance of early diagnosis and treatment. The Neurological Care and Support Framework for Action 2020-2025 was launched in December 2019 with £4.5 million uh, pounds worth of funding over five years to deliver its commitments. 
It contains five overarching aims to support improvements that span health and social care. They are to ensure people and their carers and partners in their care are given support, to improve the provision of coordinated health and social care and support for people with neurological conditions, to ensure high standards of effective person-centred and safe care and support, um, ensuring equi equitable and timely access to care and support across Scotland, and crucially, to build a sustainable neurological workforce for the future. 19 projects supporting people with uh, neurological conditions are to benefit from Scottish Government backing. The five-year uh, support action plan um, includes projects which harness new techniques and technology and, of course, continued research into these conditions, which is already producing encouraging results for changing the way we approach the care of neurological conditions. The 2022-23 award will con continue to support earlier projects, as well as invest in new schemes such as the Migraine Trust and Epilepsy Scotland, among others. The Neurological Action Plan provides a clear vision for those affected to be able to access the care and support they need to live well on their own terms, catered to their own individual needs. But, presiding officer, like all areas of healthcare, the COVID pandemic has had an unprecedented and massive effect on the delivery of this framework. However, the Scottish Government is committed to implementing it all or part of the framework as soon as, po as it possibly can and is determined to meet its objectives by 2025. And in my view, I agree with Alexandra Burnett, children and young people must be a priority and I look forward to the Minister's response on this. People must be able to access the care, support and information they need that also enables them to understand their condition following diagnosis and signpost them to relevant resources for their changing requirements. Presiding officer in Scotland, we are proud of fostering a society that treats all our people with kindness, dignity, respect and compassion. And I'm pleased that this is embedded within this framework. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Mackay. I now call Brian Whittle to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Around four minutes, please, Mr Whittle. Yeah, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I thank my esteemed colleague, Alistair, uh, Alistair, Alexander Burnett, for bringing this debate forward and allowing us once again to shine a light on the need for more government focus on neurological conditions, of which perhaps I need to get checked after that one. Um, in our roles as MSPs, we get exposed to many issues that perhaps we haven't considered before, and we've had opportunities to learn more on such a diverse range of topics. In the neurological field, I got interested in many of these topics when I was a member of the Petitions Committee, as we considered those related petitions. I even launched the National Care Framework for Huntington's Disease at Holyrood Reception back in 2017. And I note that during a Westminster debate on this subject, Hilary Benn noted that there had been a striking unity of purpose and resolve both for Scottish and UK parliaments. And many of us will have spoken in members' debates in this chamber on many such topics from MS to MND. And we do so because we recognise the importance of bringing these conditions into the light as we seek investment in delivering treatments and even cures. However, it's only when it hits closer to home that it becomes real. A few years ago, I was due to speak in a motor neuron disease debate when I heard from a good friend of mine, Derek Stark, that that very day, another friend of mine, Dodie Weir, had been diagnosed with the condition. It was made all the roar because I was expecting to see him that weekend at a charity golf day. And those of those who know him well will know him as a larger-than-life character, and a former international rugby player, and just a magnificent storyteller. And he was down to speak at that event. I discovered that actually, at that time, he was on the other side of the world with his family to watch the Lions play in New Zealand, while he still had the capability of creating memories with his family. As I said, it becomes all too real. He was given probably 18 months to live. However, in true Dory style, he's tackled his conditions the way he tackled life, head on. I haven't seen him for quite a while uh, because of COVID, and the last time was at an event for MND where he was still walking and talking and taking the mickey out of all of us. And it was great to see him on Saturday on the pitch at Murrayfield. It just made me realise that it's been a while. And he was very frustrated early on in his diagnosis with the slow progress in the development of a treatment for MND and the related conditions and decided to form My Name's Dory Foundation to try and help fund that research for a cure, knowing that it would come too late for him. And I think that is quite remarkable. 
His foundation has raised a significant seven-figure sum today, all of which will go to help delivering a cure and support for MND. His journey, along with other sporting sufferers like uh, Rob Burroughs, and the way in which the sporting world has galvanised around the cause, is such an inspiration. Deputy Presiding Officer Alexander Burnett has highlighted the Together for One in Six report from, that new, from the Neurological Alliance of Scotland, and it highlights the significant work that needs to be done by governments, including the Scottish Government, in matching the drive and ambition of Doddy and his friends. Progress is far too slow, not because of a lack of know-how, but a lack of funding of research, and it is a drag on potential breakthroughs. Diagnosis is too slow, as is access to treatment so important in these life-limiting conditions. There has been a call for a number of years to ensure that GPs and other medical staff are given the knowledge they need to both recognise the symptoms and treat them as soon as possible. Surely it is time that that was acted upon. There is a huge mental health component to a diagnosis of neurological conditions, and we know how stretched mental health services are at the moment. However, with these kind of life-shortening diagnoses, one would hope that mental health services are readily available. The report, unfortunately, says otherwise. In conclusion, Deputy Presiding Officer, in the, in the words of Doddy, he said, My attitude is you should do what you can today and worry about tomorrow when it comes. This is the card I have been dealt, so I shall just crack on. It is time the Scottish Government and other governments cracked on too. He and his likes are truly inspirational. Sporting communities have rallied round and done immeasurable work to highlight these issues. Will the Scottish Government accept that same challenge, Deputy Presiding Officer? Thank you, Mr. Fuso. I now call Jackie Bailey to be follow followed by Rhoda Grant. Around four minutes, please, Ms. Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think we should all refer to the last member who spoke as Bob Whittle in future. Um, but let me congratulate Alexander Burnett on securing this important debate on improving outcomes for people with neurological conditions. I would also like to uh, congratulate the Neurological Alliance of Scotland on the publication of their Together for the One in Six report, because it is an important piece of work which marks the first time that fieldwork in this area has extended beyond England to form a UK-wide survey, giving us that important picture across the country. Neurological conditions, as we've heard, are those which affect the brain, spine or nerves. And as the name of the report suggests, one in six people in the UK suffer with one of these conditions. We suspect that that is vastly underestimated. But living with a neurological condition can be difficult, can be debilitating, and over 80% of adults and 95% of children consulted in the report say that their condition negatively impacts upon their mental health. But the Scottish Government's approach to supporting people living with a neurological condition is patchy at best. And I hope the Minister will acknowledge that there is considerable room for improvement. We have heard in passion, please, outside and inside this Parliament for better support from people suffering with ME, with Long Covid, MS, Parkinson's, amongst many others. And my motion from last year on the need for specialist Huntington's disease services received the support of 99 MSPs, but action has nevertheless been slow. So I would welcome the Minister outlining how she will ensure that every area of Scotland finally has the specialist Huntington's care and support that's required. Now, this was promised by the Scottish Government that they back the national care framework for Huntington's disease, and yet those areas with the greatest need for support, NHS borders, no HD specialists, NHS Forth Valley, no community-based HD specialists, and NHS Tayside with no formalised HD clinical lead, are still suffering from a lack of provision. Turning back to the one in six report, it outlined that whilst the pandemic has undoubtedly played a part in worsening the outlook for people with neurological conditions, the challenges were around long before COVID-19 first appeared on the horizon. There is no doubt equally that the cost of living crisis will exacerbate the challenges because it disproportionately affects people with neurological conditions. But we've heard already data workforce, mental health support, access to early diagnosis and services are of key importance. The statistics, though, are bleak, 
And as Alexander Burnett said, 50% of adults experience delays in accessing routine appointments with their specialist nurse. 30% adults, 38% children left the consulting room with no information about their condition and no idea where to go for further support. And 69% of patients not able to access specialist support when they needed it. And we don't have up-to-date, accurate figures for how many people suffer from neurological conditions. If it's important, then let's count it, because that's how we need data to plan services. Campaigners have been fighting for action on this for long before our debate this evening, but the sense of urgency has never been greater. It's not good enough to leave people bearing the weight of these conditions without access to services and support. Up and down the country, those with a neurological condition do feel ignored. They want and deserve to see action from this government and at the very least spend the money in the budget which I believe Alexander Burnett has highlighted as being underspent. So that's where the recommendations from the one in six report come in. These are all actions that the Scottish Government can take and can do so now. The Neurological Alliance of Scotland have done the heavy lifting for you. They've spelled out what is needed and it is now up to the government to act. So I hope that the Minister will commit to seeing these actions through for all those who live with a neurological condition and for those who might one day receive such a diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Bailey. I now call Rhoda Grant, who is joining us remotely, to be followed by Daniel Johnson, who will be the last speaker before I ask the Minister to respond. Around four minutes, please, Ms Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I want to thank Alexander Burnett for bringing this debate to the Chamber. The Together for One in Six report from the Neurological Alliance in Scotland has highlighted a number of worrying issues, and I want to draw on two worrying examples from my own constituency to give a bit of context. The first is that of essential tremor. I have raised the issue of magnetic res re res resonance guided focused ultrasound, and that will be the last time I say it in the debate, to be made available on the NHS in Scotland for essential tremor patients. An issue raised by my constituent Mary Ramsey in her petition in the Parliament we have the equipment and the skills available in Scotland and yet we're referring and paying for patients to be treated south of the border because MRG FUS is available on the NHS in England. And despite the long waiting lists that we have in Scotland for deep brain stimulation, the Scottish Government refused to support the rollout of this less invasive and considerably less expensive a procedure on the NHS, which is actually available here in Dundee. I hope the Cabinet Secretary will meet with those who deliver MRG FUS treatment at the drop-in event in the Parliament next March. I also wish to turn to the provision of MS specialist nursing. Clinical standards were launched in 2009 to set out the level of care for people with MS that, that people with MS should expect. The MS Society in Scotland estimate around 15,750 people in Scotland are actually living with MS. And the prevalence of those living with MS in the Western Isles is among the highest in the world. In 2011, I brought the issue of an MS specialist nurse for the Western Isles to this chamber, and subsequently an MS specialist nurse post was created in the Western Isles in line with every mainland health board in Scotland. However, NHS Western Isles have chosen to cut their specialist MS nurse post along with their specialist epilepsy nurse and replace them with a more generalist advanced neurological nurse. And this was done without consultation with local people or national stakeholders, including the MS Society, who had initially provided pump round funding for the post. The caseload for that one generalist advanced neurologic, neurological nurse has increased profoundly. That generalist nurse right now is estimated to support a thousand patients. The recommended caseload for one nurse treating just MS patients is around 315, and this is with additional support that is not available in the Western Isles. Even under the Western Isles proposal to have two full-time general neurological nurses, the caseload is still far too high. 
I'm concerned that this decision made without consultation with pa patients will be copied throughout Scotland, placing standards of care and accessibility to treatment at risk. Let me be clear, the decision is one that does not save money, it rather increases the cost and burden on the NHS. In a cost of living crisis, surely we should be supporting more localised delivery of specialist services. MS specialist nurses play a vital role in helping those who live with MS access important rehabilitation treatment and disease modifying therapies shown to reduce the progression of their MS. Removing and reducing access to that vital care is putting patients at risk. The GEMSS MS specialist nurse evaluation project suggests that each MS specialist nurse saved on average 77 £1,400 per year. Government must live up to its promises and they must ensure that MS nurses and posts are retained and I ask them to do so. Thank you, Ms Grant. I now call Daniel Johnson around four minutes, please, Mr Johnson. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I uh, thank Alexander Burnett for uh, bringing this uh, important matter to the Chamber. Indeed, it gives me great pleasure to, to follow uh, on from him and others in this debate, you know, given his uh, work that uh, he, he carries out through the CPG and autism. <clears throat> and indeed, I'm very pleased to be the Vice Chair of that. And indeed, I just uh, direct uh, members to my register of interest in that I am the Vice Chair of the ADHD Foundation. And, and I, I would, in, in a sense, apologise if I stray into things which are maybe, uh, you know, I, I think are very much neurological conditions. Uh, I very much come from a perspective and a knowledge of neurodevelopmental disorders. But given that neurological conditions c encompass such a broad range of conditions, ranging from epilepsy to autism, motor neuron disease to cerebral palsy, encompassing things which are lifelong conditions to those which are sudden onset, those which are uh, chronic but stable uh, to those that are degenerative and indeed ultimately uh, fatal. We are talking about a very broad range of conditions, a broad range of understandings, a broad range of needs requirements and help and assistance that people need. And it strikes me that the, the point that the, the member made in his introduction is therefore a vital one. We are talking about a broad range of different conditions, broad range of needs. Therefore, we must have data. If you don't have data, then you can't ensure that you're addressing those conditions properly, providing those services. But it's not just actually the, the act of capturing that data is, uh, in itself. That, that act of capturing that data, uh, screening, can help the individuals as well. And this is something that is well known, been long called for, is that we frequently miss those opportunities to identify those individuals at the point that they come into contact with public services. So we must capture the data, both in terms of public policy, but also to help individuals. Um, and I'd also just point out, when it comes to these facts, there is a real cost of not understanding these things. And certainly the conditions that, that I know most about, if you look at the criminal justice system, I, see, I think you see profound public policy failure. Around 25% of the prison population are estimated to have ADHD compared to 5% of the general population. 50% of the prison population are dyslexic compared to 15% of the general population. Autism is about three times overrepresented and 60% of the prison population have a traumatic brain injury. This is shocking. It's a sign of public policy failure. I would say it's a sign of injustice. And I think it's something that we need to correct. And unless we understand the problem, collect the data, we'll never be able to do that. And I would just ask the Minister in her remarks whether or not there's an opportunity for these conditions to be uh, uh, included or at least thought about as when the government brings forward its uh, uh, recommendations for Commissioner on Autism, Learning Disability and Neurodiversity. And if not, it certainly I think it needs to be given some thought and consideration. Because it's not just, I think, about ensuring that there are services and treatment for people, but I think it's also about having wider public policy. We're talking about conditions which are very often invisible disabilities. And therefore, it's not just about treatment, but having wider public policy to maximise accessibility and ensure that people can lead a normal day-to-day -day life. And finally, I would just like to echo and reinforce the points around access to diagnosis. Can I just say the survey work is welcome, but I think it grossly underestimates the severity of the problem. My casework is full of people that are not just struggling to uh, 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 get a diagnosis or assessment, within 12 months. They're struggling to get it within two or even three 
years. That's just an appalling failure. You cannot help people until they actually get the diagnosis they need. They understand their condition. And the waiting times that people are currently experiencing are frankly unacceptable. And I would be very grateful to understand from the Minister of what is being done to improve waiting times for assessment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Johnson. I now call Minister Marie Todd to respond to the debate. Around seven minutes, please, Minister. Yes, microphone, Minister. Maybe. Thank you, Minister. Many apologies for that. That's a rookie error. Um, presiding officer, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to respond to this important motion on behalf of the government this afternoon. As we continue to reform the delivery of health and social care in Scotland, I've been really keen to hear firsthand about the experiences and the priorities of the neurological community. That's why we funded the Neurological Alliance of Scotland to facilitate a patient experience survey in Scotland. We actively supported the Alliance to produce the Together for the One in Six report, and I discussed its findings with the Epilepsy and MS cross-party group in June. We want to know about people's experiences. We want to know where the gaps are. We want to improve services. We want to understand the experiences of those accessing care in Scotland so that we can work in partnership to identify good practice and to drive up standards. The time frame for the report encompasses the most severe pressure our NHS has ever seen. We know that people have faced delays to diagnosis and treatment. We know that further action and investment is needed to ensure that people with neurological conditions access timely diagnosis and care. And we are working hard to address this through strategies such as our NHS recovery and workforce plans. That's why our NHS recovery plan is backed by the more than one billion of funding over five years. The plan will support increased diagnostic procedures, inpatient and outpatient activity to increase capacity and to address backlogs of treatment as we work towards achieving that 12-week treatment time guarantee. Through our neurological care and support framework, Scottish Government and the Centre for Sustainable Delivery are addressing workforce issues and care pathways. Through this neurological improvement work, we are supporting NHS boards to appoint the right staff, address neurology waiting times and improve training and career pathways. Now, despite the disruption to health and social care services during the pandemic, we have sustained our efforts to deliver the commitments of our neurological framework. The focus and funding for the framework has been maintained and we've spent over £2.1 million over the past two years on work to improve neurological care through, across Scotland. The scope and reach of the work commissioned is wide and has direct impact on improving patient care and support, including pa patient and ca carer information, better integration of services, improved care pathways and workforce capacity planning. The framework was published in 2019 and the current landscape in health and social care has, of course, significantly changed because of the pandemic. The shifting infrastructure has brought new challenges in implementing aspects of this improvement work. So in light of this, we are continually assessing how we prioritise and focus our efforts to best effect. Under the guidance of our National Advisory Committee on Neurological Conditions, we are prioritising those outcomes which will have the most impact. Despite these difficulties, we've demonstrated a substantial progress. And in July, we published a midpoint report setting out the significant impacts that have been made to date and the ongoing work to bring about lasting improvements to neurological services. My colleagues have today urged for better data collection, and I'm pleased to see that a search of the Spire primary care data system has been completed for neurological conditions and will publish new prevalence data for these conditions on the 13th of December which will help to support future service planning. Certainly. Brian Whittle. I'm very grateful uh, for the Minister giving way. It's actually to, to, to Daniel Johnson's uh, point during his speech when he says that these neurological conditions are, are far too overrepresented in places like 
uh, prisons. I wonder if, as part of that work, uh, will the Scottish Government look at the, the, the amount of money, and if we invest in one side of the ledger, how we take that out, how we come out the other side of the ledger, which would allow us to continually invest more into neurological conditions? Minister. So I'm certainly keen to look at how we invest money that has the greatest impact. And, and that impact wouldn't simply just be in terms of clinical impact. We would be looking holistically at person-centred care, so at the entirety of people's needs. I mean, I think, I don't know, I, the, there are challenges. At, at, today we're talking about neurological care. I know there's a big overlap with neurodevelopmental conditions. And I think that largely Daniel Johnson was talking about neurodevelopmental conditions and their over-representation in prison. The, how we separate these out and how we, how we so, so I was just going to say the important thing to me is that individual patient needs are met and that we are able to treat people holistically in a person-centred way wherever they are presenting. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm grateful to the Minister for giving me, I mean, I, I, but I, I mean, I very clearly pointed to TBI which I think certainly has neurological aspects. I think the key point, absolutely having holistic thing, but it's also about, I think, understanding the points at which people might come into contact with various public services, public bodies, and thinking about actually how we can use that as an opportunity, both to help them, but also capture data and understand that better. And whether that's the prison service or the health service, that's important. I think, really, is that, would the minister agree with that point? Minister. I would absolutely agree with that point, and I think there's a real opportunity to improve prisoners' help, health at the time that they are in prison, and I think there's a real opportunity to make a lasting impact on their life while they are in prison, which will last way beyond their stay in prisons. Absolutely couldn't agree more. Um, Alexander Burnett raised the um, issue of the workforce plan. Now, while the NHS recovery plan and the workforce plan weren't condition specific, um, the aim is to effect whole system recovery and to support prioritisation and planning. And I mentioned, you know, our National Advisory Committee for Neurological Conditions are identifying priorities to strengthen the neurological workforce um, alongside the national workforce strategy, the remobilisation plans and the rehabilitation framework. Yes, sir. Alexander Burnett. I thank the Minister uh, for taking that intervention. Uh, yeah, as we near the end of the debate, uh, yeah, could I be so rude as to just repeat uh, the, the substance of a, the main question this evening, uh, which I asked and which Jackie Bailey asked, uh, and which those in the gallery uh, have come to ask as well, uh, is whether the Minister will commit now to allocate the remaining 2.3 million uh, by 2025. Minister. So on allocating the remaining funding, we are continually assessing how we prioritise and focus our efforts under the guidance of the National Advisory Committee, some of whom are here in the gallery today as well. They are guiding us and prioritising the actions that will have the greatest impact for people who are living with a neurological condition. Would the Minister take an intervention on that point? Certainly. Jackie Bailey. I absolutely endorse the process she's outlined, but I think the question was simple. Is the money still available to be spent? Minister. Yes, the money is still available to be spent. What we want to do is to spend it with the greatest impact. Um, let me quickly cover a couple of the other points that have been um, raised during this um, debate. I've met with the Scottish Huntington's Association to discuss the points from Jackie Bailey's motion. We have since 2015 committed over half a million in funding to the Scottish Huntington's Association towards the development of a national care framework and to support the organisation's specialist support um, devices and, and, and uh, initiatives to raise awareness of the condition. On patient information provision through the neurological framework, we're funding several projects to improve the provision of good quality information to people with neurological conditions. We're also working with NHS Inform, which is a fabulous platform. It's basically our NHS, our Scottish NHS on the web. Um, we're working with consultant neurologists and third sector partners to review and to create content on neurological conditions for that website. And new and updated pages have already been published for conditions such as MS, epilepsy, FND and Huntington's disease. Um, I, I think because uh, I've taken a few interventions, we're a little bit short of time. I'd like to thank everyone who's contributed stories, experiences today. I want to close by returning to the findings of Together for the One in Six report. We know that data is not just data, that there are human stories and individual experiences behind those numbers. And I want to ensure you, 
assure you that we can, will continue to work with the data to understand the underlying factors contributing to it, to listen to the lived experience in developing solutions. And we will continue the improvement work we've begun through the framework, collaborating with partners across statutory and third sector to achieve better outcomes and maximise the quality of life for people with neurological conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. That concludes the debate and I close this meeting.